Okay, and welcome to this sheet farm presentation. Uh, this is going to be part one of two presentations. Uh, what I've done is I've edited the May 18th live event we did in Huddersfield, and I've split it into two presentations. Uh, the first presentation will be two hours long, and it goes through genealogy of some of the famous Hollywood stars that we uh, often talk about, like Mac Damon, George Clooney, J Lo, Ben Affleck. Tom Hanks, etc., etc. Some interesting things that have dug up on these people, and you know, I think you'll find the genealogy very interesting as well. So this will be released um, as usual as a podcast. Um, it'll be released in two parts, obviously, as in be released for members and non-members as usual. First hour for non-members, and members get the full two hours as a as a prelude to releasing this presentation on YouTube. Um, it seems to be YouTube friendly. I've had it up there for a while now, and I've no, I've had no comeback uh, for everybody. But the, it will be a presentation as well, and you'll see the live event uh, unfold. And then the following weeks, uh, I will release part two of this presentation, which will also be about two hours long, uh, and that will cover a few of the interesting families like Lawrence Fox um, and people like that, the Fleming family, and also. I've done roughly about over and just over an hour on Dom Jolly's background to finish it all off. So I'm sure you'll enjoy part two when that's released. And we'll do the same thing with that. It'll be released in two parts, members and non-members. Um, and then we'll release it on YouTube um, as a premiere. So we'll have a chat going on there as well. And also mixed in with this uh, release, you'll see some of the video from the live event as well that I've mixed into the... Um, video it, when you do get round to watching the video. Okay, that's it for now. Hi everybody, um, welcome to Sheep Farm Live, uh, thanks for coming, uh, quiet in the cheap seats please, um, <laughs> everybody got a drink from the bar, so before we start, um, I think we're, are we having an interval, fire. there's one guy left, are we having an interval? <laughs> Can't blame him, he's going to listen to us idiots, <laughs> um, are we having an interval? Yeah, we'll, we'll, it'll be about an hour and a half this and then we'll, we'll we'll have a break, and then Mark's going to come on and do a presentation as well uh, when he arrives. And then later on, he'll start about four-ish till about half five. And we're not going to be glued on time, you know, where our presentations go like. Yeah. Have you got a tablet? Yeah, it's free beer. Yeah, we have it. It's in your from your <laughs> it's from your wallet. <clears throat> we copied your card as you came through, and yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so then we'll do a Q&A and a mini discussion uh, probably afterwards, more of a discussion. I've got a few stuff that we'll talk about with Mark as well. <clears throat> um, but yeah, did anybody come to the last one? Yeah, yeah. Well, it'd be the same presentation, so you might as well go. I'm not joking. <laughs> <laughs> Hardcore. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, there's a couple of things in it that are the same because they're linked with uh, some of the stuff. But I've gone a bit, little bit more, went a bit nuts this week, actually. Uh, thanks to Lorraine. <laughs> <laughs> Always someone to blame, Lorraine. Yeah, no, no, it was me. Usually uh, me. Yeah. Yeah. It's all your fault. <laughs> Everything's my fault. Yeah. Uh, just, if you haven't seen us before, you do think his nostrils are bigger than mine, don't you? <laughs> should have got that in, should I? I can't yeah, believe what you're saying. I'm straight in with it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we all know who's got the biggest nostrils. <laughs> <laughs> it's Edwin. <laughs> By the way, um, just to say, I know I said this in his uh, podcast, but everyone says how weird it is to see us here, but he's definitely weirder for us. <laughs> it's high for a hundred people. <laughs> From the corner of my pokey little living room to where it's very bizarre. <laughs> it, weren't, it weren't so much we 
planned, you know. Um, definitely not. Anyway, here we are. But here we are. I'd like to thank all the staff at Pennine Manor as well for allowing us to do these type of talks. Places are getting a bit thin on the ground. We can do these things. It's thanks to our mate Louise who will be in later on. Uh, she works here. Um, and uh, and Josh as well, who's not here today, uh, for helping us get, get this on. Uh, because, like I said, they've got another one actually in the northeast, which might be an interesting uh, thing. They're just renovating it at the moment. So the back end of the summer, I'm talking to them about doing one up there. Nathan <laughs> and Chris. <laughs> um, yeah, so this is entitled No Plumbers Allowed 2. Um, if you know why we call it that, Mark's got this uh, ongoing theme where he says none of these people's parents are plumbers uh, and in, the gene, in the gene pool. So what well, I put, no plumbers allowed in the gene pool, if you like. But actually, I've actually found one. I've actually found a plumber. Well, it's, uh, it's, more, to, it's more to do with the fact that... And it's not that weird... Uh, Rod Stewart looking freak. <laughs> <That's all>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who looks like Rod Stewart. Uh, it looks like Rod Stewart's ah, ass there, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Plimlico or whatever it's called. He, Mark says that um they're all military and none of them are ever plumbers. If you yeah. knew if everyone were a, everyone's parent were a plumber, it'd be weird. Yeah, it would be weird, yeah. Much. Right, well I, I I'm gonna start with this video. So if you were here last time you would have seen this Julian Huxley video. What is the bearing of the laws of heredity upon human affairs? Eugenics provides the answer, so far as this is known. Eugenics seeks to apply the known laws of heredity so as to prevent the degeneration of the race and improve its inborn qualities. Here is a man who, although normal, comes from a mentally defective family. Here is his wife, who is also normal. They have had 17 children. Let us examine the pedigree of these children. Five of them died in infancy. Three are still too young for an opinion to be formed of their mental state, a boy and two girls. Only two of the remaining children are normal, a man and a girl. The remaining seven children are all mental defectives, marked on the pedigree in black. Of these, two live at home, a man and a crippled dwarf girl. There is one man in an institution and a woman with the mentality of a child. The other three are all girls and are all in an institution. How has this disastrous state of affairs come about? If we examine the pedigree of this family, we find that although the father and mother of the youngest generation are both normal, the father's brother was insane. Their mother was normal, but the father, the grandfather of the youngest generation, was defective and his two brothers insane. Another famous family is that of the Terrys. All the individuals drawn in light color on this pedigree possess exceptional talents for the stage, music and art. Dame Ellen Terry, the great actress, was one of the most outstanding members of this family. Here is her portrait as Lady Macbeth, which is now in the Tate Gallery. Beside it stands her daughter, Edith Craig, who is an actress and an expert in historical stage costume and well known as a producer of stage plays and pageants. Her brother, Gordon Craig, is recognized both in England and abroad as a genius who has been a notable pioneer in modern stage design and lighting. His son, Edward Carrick, is a stage designer and artist. Now let us see some of the other well-known members of this family. Ellen Terry's brother, Fred Terry, the famous actor, married Julia Nielsen, an actress and singer. Their daughter, Phyllis Nielsen Terry, is a distinguished actress with a beautiful singing voice. Her brother, the late Dennis Nielsen Terry, had a distinguished career in the theatre, and his daughter Hazel is now at the beginning of her career on the films. Ellen Terry's elder sister, Kate, was, before her marriage, an even more distinguished actress than Dame Ellen Terry. One of her daughters is Mabel Terry Lewis, the actress, and another daughter, Kate, married Frank Gilgood, a fine amateur pianist. Of their children, Val is dramatic producer at the BBC, and John is perhaps our leading romantic actor. And so, if we want to maintain the race at a high level, physically and mentally, everybody sound in body and mind should marry and have enough children to perpetuate their stock and carry on the race. And that's Sir Julian Huxley, uh, president of the British Eugenics Society, uh, who had mental issues. Uh, we've mentioned that in some... He was in an institution for, in the early, around about 1914 with his brother, um, his brother committed suicide, and, 
and he's talking about mental defectives. Um, yeah, interesting. Um, so our talk today is going to be about individuals that are working behind the mainstream um, from some chosen bloodline family. And in this presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about the Oppenheimer producers, although I did, I did mention that we did that last, last time, but it's more of a lead-in um, <coughs> to the cast of some of the actors within the Oppenheimer uh, film, um, which are linked, the, the individually, some of them are linked in many different ways. Uh, Cillian Murphy, Emily Blunt, Matt Damon, Robert Downey Jr., Sir Kenneth Branagh, as well as uh, George Clooney, Tom Wanks, we're going to talk about him, um, ben Affleck, J-Lo, uh, the Wachowski brothers, Kardashians, and Dom Jolly. We'll talk about him. Which, we've done quite a lot of work on him. Whether we get time to go through every single thing that I've got here, um, I don't think we will, but... Um, so, and the Fox family, Lawrence Fox's family as well. Lawrence Fox's family sums up what Julian Huxley was saying there. In fact, some of his family related to uh, Fred Terry, that we were talking about in there. And so some of them... Some of the Fox family are related to the Terrys and the Gill Goods and what have you. So they're the next line line in. But also Nigel Haver's family as well. The Hoppenheimer, or the Hoppenheim name, and family blood ties is an interesting one. Um, obviously you've got banking, you've got South African diamonds, um, and obviously the physics side of it as well in America. So the German uh, angle of the Oppenheims, um, and the name itself comes from the Frankfurt area of Hess. Um, and so they're all intertwined. They, they, uh, Oppenheim and Hoppenheimer are the same name. They all come from the area of Hoppenheim. So, and they obviously got the Frankfurt University. So it was an interesting story. I don't know if you've heard us tell the story about the Nolans, not the Nolan singers, as in the sisters, but uh, Christopher Nolan and his, his family. Has anybody heard, heard that story? I know some people who've been here already will have done. Have you, yeah. Um, I think we talked about Rise Above, don't we? Yeah, we, we, we have mentioned it a few times over the last few weeks because it's, it's an interesting, a very interesting story. So you've got um, uh, Dame Emma uh, Nolan, or Lady Nolan, as she is now. She's just been uh, given a gong. Uh, and that's another thing you seem to realise. A lot of these people have got uh, gongs, more gongs than a gong collector. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, she, she earned recogn recognition for producing all the films by her husband, Sir Christopher Nolan, who's just been given a gong in March as well, uh, that have grossed about $6 billion worldwide. So it's not the monetary thing, it's more the influence that a lot of these films have, um, which I know we, we're going to talk about in a sec. So that's her there. Go on, sir. No, but the reason we're out, the Nolan's, the fallout, the fallout thing. No, the reason that we... No, we're gonna, we are going to... Oh, sorry. You haven't read it, have you? I have read it. No, it's just pointless, isn't it? <laughs> My work is pointless. It's just pointless to uh, yeah. No, we are going to talk about that, though. No, we're not going to skip that. Um, so, yeah, they made, the, obviously, the film Oppenheimer. Uh, her, further, her father worked in the civil service, and she was going to be part of the civil service as well in the Far East, uh, the Middle East, and she intended to join the, being a diplomat and etc. But she decided to go into the film industry. And you see this quite a lot, that there's people going into, or they've got family in the diplomatic services, that tend to then go into the media services or um, films or music. Um, Christopher Nolan's uncle, you can see him there with that lady in the middle, um, he was an actor as well. And that lady there was the lady from Aloha Aloha, uh, Helga Grehart. And she was also, also in Sapphire and Steel, who Mark goes on about, because Judge Jules's father was the director of the DJ, Judge Jules, was a DJ, it was a DJ, was the director of Sapphire and Steel in the 70s. Um, and his granddad, Judge Jules' granddad, if I get this right, was director of the company that brought the thalidomide drug into Britain. Yeah. I don't, I don't think he puts that on his resume. When are you booking him? Can I book Judge Jules? Yeah, look, look, he's got a great resume. Thalidomide, oh, I wonder what record that is. Uh. And anyway, his brother that you see there, on your other left, um, over there, uh, that's uh, Jonathan Nolan, and this is where we're going to talk about that bit now, Chris. Yeah, right here, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Jonathan Nolan and his wife signed a 150 million dollar deal with Amazon in 2019, paying him 20 million a year. Uh, 
as executive producers of The Peripheral, and have just released the new uh, series, Fallout. Which, so he, his brother's re releasing Oppenheimer, he's releasing Fallout at the same time. So, work that oh, one the, out. The, no, the point being is, obviously Oppenheimer was a, a propaganda to scare the shit out of everybody about nuclear weapons again after the 80s, like a re rejigging of that. So he made the Oppenheimer that everyone was talking about last year, won loads of awards, etc. And I was pointing out that then his brother makes Fallout, which is about everyone hiding in bunkers from the fallout of a nuclear war, basically. But both those films show quite graphically, well, I haven't seen, I haven't seen um, Oppenheimer actually, but they show quite graphically a nuclear bomb going off and the devastation, which we hadn't really seen in films for a long, long time, I don't think. Um, and he was just interested. In and it coincides inside. with all the Ukraine, Russian yeah. tanks and- Yeah, yeah. Uh, just terrifying the shit out of everybody. Yeah. And also that other film he did, The Peripheral, which is a, uh, uh, it's a TV, so I've actually watched it. It wasn't very good, but it, it, again, it showed um, the streets of, of uh, England in London, uh, the whole earth actually, there'd been some kind of catastrophe and half the population was wiped out. So you just had random single people wandering around the streets. So again, he was plugging that. I think they were gonna make a second series, but it got canceled. But just interesting that these two brothers are um, yeah, making more nuclear propaganda. And also in Fallout, they're in the bunker. And <clears throat> excuse me, in the original, in the game, uh, the, the bunkers have got different numbers. And in the, in the film, the, the TV show, it's Bunker 33. So everyone's walking around with a nice big yellow 33 on the back, wherever you make of that. <laughs> we know what to make of that. Um, Christopher Nolan, well, their, their other uncle who also worked at NASA building guidance systems for rocket programs. So their uncle worked, for, worked at NASA for the Apollo rocket program. And he apparently sent uh, Christopher Nolan, uh, the first guy we were talking about, the launch footage. And, and he refilmed it and put them on screen in one of his films. What's that film he, he did? Interstellar, was it? Interstellar. Yeah. So apparently that's Apollo rocket footage bollocks. Yeah. <laughs> So one of the, one of the interesting uh, parts of this that it's sort of it's, you, yeah you have to slap yourself around face sometimes or slap Chris around face. Um, I read an article about the third brother, the elder brother called um, Matthew Nolan, uh, and his sordid past of the third brother, um, and he was an accused assassin or hitman. Wish I had a third brother. Yeah, so do I. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Especially if, we, if it was an assassin and a hitman. Yeah, yeah. Fucked. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He's coming now. <laughs> do him. Garotta. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the article, it says Matthew Nolan, the eldest of the two Nolan brothers, uh, had a checkered past. This was the early 2000s we're talking here. And he was uh, it involved stolen money, uh, diamond dealing, which again goes back to the Hoppenheimers, gem dealing. Um, I hadn't even thought about that till just then. Um, two possible murders and two assassins and a jailbreak in the early 2000s. And it happened in Costa Rica and there was, they actually put out a extradition order on uh, Matthew Nolan. And I won't go through the whole story, but it's quite in an, an interesting story. But when he was arrested in America on another charge, they said he, he did a Batman-like escape in, from this correction center. Um, but he had a pseudonym, and this is where the story gets a bit odd. So he, he had a pseudonym, pseudonym, remember this is the early 2000, 2003, 4, when this guy was killed in Costa Rica. And he went to meet him using, a, using, this, using his pseudonym, and he called himself Matthew McCall Oppenheimer. And it's in court records, the court records are there. Um, if you read them all, they're all through there. There's, it's in the testimony. Um, a bit weird that to you guys, or is it just me and you? <laughs> <laughs> and also, the, 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 the Christopher Nolan directed Batman. That's why the Batman like escapes also yeah. s slightly weird. So that that got me thinking about um, possible links to <laughs> hitman, hitmen, politics, and Hollywood actor actors uh, and actresses. Um, so a lot of these people are going to pop up in this presentation. I've got links to a lot of the 20th century. Um, uh, in the 21st century, uh, assassins and hitmen. So I'll use Sherry Blair as an example. She was called Sherry Booth, um, and Lady Blair as she is now. Uh, she was went to the London School of Economics. Um, sister's also a broadcaster, journalist, activist, old in a 
VIP Palestinian Authority passport, apparently, mm. okay. um, as well as a British passport, um, and a vocal opponent of the Iraq war, which is interesting considering her uh, brother-in-law <laughs> is a terrorist. Um, and uh, uh, their father was uh, actor Tony Booth, who was in, in sickness and health with Alf Garnett. Um, and they're related to John Wilkes Booth, who apparently shot um, President Lincoln. So that whole family, the, the Wilkes Booth families were, were all actors as well. So then we've got uh, Kevin Bacon and Kyra Sedgwick, his wife. They're related to uh, John Hinckley Jr. who shot Reagan. And, and they're related also to Barack Obama, George Washington, uh, Nancy Reagan. Uh, so they're related to the person that shot Reagan. They're also related to his wife. Work that one out. Mm. They were related to Ulysses Grant, uh, lots of different, Gerald Ford, Fre President Roosevelt, yeah, Richard Nixon, both Bushes. You need two Bushes in your life. Um, so then we've got Mark David Chapman, um, who is the ninth, ninth cousin of Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, as well as uh, Catherine Hepburn, John Wayne, Humphrey Bogart, and many others. And he's also the 10th cousin of John Inkley Jr. Then we've heard the story about Woody Halson and his, his father, who was apparently one of the tramps within the J, that picture there that's at the top, uh, of, in the JFK uh, assassination or wherever it was. Um, and he's, his brother um, has a podcast now called, is it Son of an Assassin or something like that? Um, or where? Yep. Then we have astronaut Alan Bart, Bartlett Shepard. And I did some research for, for Crow, actually. I sent him it. Um, and he shares a bloodline with serial killers John Wayne Gacy and Jeffrey Dahmer. So he was the first man in space. <laughs> I've just thought, they've got Miles Copeland. And I wish Mark were here because we've got Leonard Cohen as well. He did a podcast, I don't know if he did that, uh, that podcast with that lady. She's called Anne Diamond as well. Um, and she said Leonard Cohen were a hitman. Am I right there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And also, I, I, I looked fl fleetingly at um, some of Leonard Cohen's lyrics, and one of one of his songs was actually called "My Secret Life," and it was, if you read it, it literally was sounded like you were talking about a secret life as an agent. Um, I'm not a Leonard Cohen big fan or anything, but <laughs> <laughs> so I started looking into the cast of um, Oppenheimer, and. I, I did, some of them I went deep, some of them I didn't. So Slim Murphy, I just had a quick look at him. But I found it, he was the Beatles obsessed uh, and he had a band in his early 20s and called The Sons of Mr. Green at Jeans, which adopted from a Frank Zappa song. But he confessed that they apparently got uh, record labels wanting to sign him. But he confessed that I'm glad in retrospect we didn't sign because you kind of sign away your life to a label and the whole of your music. But yeah, he's doing the same thing in films. It didn't, that sort of didn't make sense that to me, that uh, Cillian Murphy. So he's going to be an interesting character to go in a little bit deeper on his Cillian Murphy. Um, there's something about him that just didn't ring true for me. I don't know where it is, but maybe it's his eyes. Or might, might, he might look at me saying, with my gog goggle he's eyes. He's got be beautiful blue eyes. Beautiful blue <laughs> eyes, yes. I think it was Lance that was saying that they've got that aesthetic look that uh, Leonardo da Vinci said he could put a protraction on. You know, it's not like you're... Say your ears. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're one fucking eye. Yeah. <laughs> what do you mean, symmetry? Um, yeah, symmetry, symmetry yeah. Or, or my Leeds Bradford eyes. <laughs> 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 or your man all cover nostrils. And carry on. I want yeah. big titties. Yeah, 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 yeah. So, Robert Downey Jr., an interesting character. Yeah. It was a strange character because I was looking at his uh, his filmography, the films he's been in. He was his dad, his dad was a drug addict, and he got him on drugs when he was very young. And I, I guess we all remember him just being like a bit of a hellraiser, don't we? But, he, but how weird he was a hellraiser, constantly in trouble, but then constantly working all the way through everything. But he's, he's Another one with a cheat code. Yeah, just got that elevated. Uh, I mean, and then everyone knows he made Iron Man, and then he just went. He's been super famous ever since, but he's been making films since he was a kid. Um, and he, his, da his, his, his family is like, his, his dad, his dad's uh, half Lithuanian Jew, half Hungarian Jew, and I, oh sorry, quarter uh, Hungarian Jew, quarter Irish. 
and his dad was a filmographer and a uh, director as well. And his mum's uh, just English, Scottish, German, and Swiss German. We've, we've all got that kind of. There. We've, all, we've all got that kind of background. I we? have. The, we have. The, I was <laughs> yeah. a bit different. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was from probably more slave. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but Kenneth Branagh, his dad was a plumber. <laughs> yeah, but was he like Rod Stewart, look-alike plumber level? Come on. Oh, just a normal plumber. Don't worry, there'll be no heckling or all like that. <laughs> Time you call this. Yeah, yeah. Bars closed. Yeah, yeah so, no, he was uh, a real-life plumber, a joiner. He ran a company specialised in fitting partitions and suspended ceilings. Ran a company, though. It's a bit different from... Yeah, he probably was a plumber in his in his early days, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Yeah, but so we're blooming uh, Rod Stewart look like Terra, Terra Hawk. Yeah, me, well, yeah. <laughs> Maybe he knows him. <laughs> if there were one thing that were going to convince me to get a jib jab, it would definitely Rod Stewart look like. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you want to talk about Dame Emma Thompson? Because she, did you say she's not married to. Uh, no, she's married to Branner, Branner isn't she? But I mean, I, I uh, yeah. Her although his, uh, his dad was a plumber um, and he fitted suspended ceilings. Um, <laughs> or was, was suspenders, one or two, I can't remember. Anyway, um, he married Dame Emma Thompson, um, and she comes from a family of actors as well. And her dad, Norman Thompson, was um, narrated The Magic Roundabout. Right. She, came, she, came, she came out of nowhere, did Emma Thompson, didn't she? Um, I don't well, know she's she a dame now. Yeah, but now she's like British royalty, isn't she? Yeah, yeah. Um, she's also an active environmentalist in global climate warming bollocks change. Of course she is. <laughs> yeah, of course she is. She's a supporter of Greenpeace. And, uh, and as part of her campaign against global climate warming bollocks change, uh, she supported the Lung London Extinction Rebellion rally against climate change. Although she received a lot of criticism, Chris, because she flew five and a half thousand miles to get there. <laughs> <laughs> so as you do. Yeah, as you do. She yeah. might have had the same fuel that uh, old Gates had. Yeah, Gates has got there. some good fuel, yeah, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Eco-fuel. Eco I use eco-fuel, yeah. Bitch tits fuel. Uh, Emily Blunt, interesting character. She was one in that, st that stood out, really. Um, and she she's sort of... Come, a lot of these stars come out of nowhere, but is that what happens, you know? She's a recipient of several accolades, Golden Globes, Actors Awards, etc. But she... Um, is the second of four children born to another actress and barrister Oliver Blunt, uh, I said Blunt, Q QC, a famous criminal barrister and father of actress Emily. And she went to school with the Jaggers and an uncle in the government and was mentored by Judy Dench and Meryl Streep. Emily's late fa grandfather was Major General Peter Blunt, British Army officer and businessman. He was present at the signing of the unconditional German surrender at Lundberg Heath on, in 1945. After he uh, left the army, he joined Allied Control Commission, the Allied Control Commission in Germany, and he was an inspector at Bletchley Park. So now we see, we're just linking now into intelligence here. And he was also director of Associated Newspapers, not a bad mixer, intelligence which owned Daily Mail, Mail Online, Mail on Sunday. And this was a few years ago, so I'm not saying it was part of Mail Online, but they do trip into these publications as well. His brother-in-law, Emily's great uncle, was Major General Thomas Anthony Richardson, MBE, and he was the oldest son of Major General T.W. Richardson. And he, she, he married uh, Anthea Fry, Professor uh, Dennis Fry's um, daughter, and he was an experimental professor at the University of College London in phonetics. So again, there's no plumbers here, no plumbers here at all. Um, but th she has got government links, there's no doubt about that. And she also has got into the LGBT side of it um, as well. Just a slight interlude here. Um, Emily Blunt is the second of four children born to actress and English teacher, that's another actress, Joanna Mackey, and barrister Oliver Blunt QC. He's a famous criminal barrister, and he is the father of, obviously, Emily Blunt. All her brothers and sisters are uh, actors as well. Emily's husband uh, is an actor and filmmaker, John Karansky, or Krasinski. 
Um, Time named him one of the most hundred influential people in the world. And remember, Time is owned by World Economic Forum stroke Young Global Leader, uh, as we shall find out later. In an interview he did, uh, John Krasinski also sold the 2020 stroke 2021. Um, In an interview he did, he he said um, his heart was shattered when his children asked him if they'd be okay during the uh, nonsense. So he and both of them selling the uh, nonsense as well. He played, um, he played that part as well. The what's that? clear and pleasant danger. John, John Kransky. Yeah, yeah. He played that uh, secret agent, right? Who uh, Harrison Ford played. What's right. his name? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. Tom Clancy guy. You think he did a TV series with him mm. about about him? So again, if they're making shows like that, they've uh, got CIA influence, haven't they? His sister is a literary agent. Uh, for the Curtis Brown Group, um, she's married to Stanley Tucci. You remember that actor in American American actor Stanley Tucci. So they're quite a linked. Uh, the Curtis Brown Group as well are owned by the, a massive talent organisation that basically owns all all the talents. You, you know, and and I, and I looked up a few of the people that were owned, that were on the contracts to some of these uh, comedians, uh, like Jim Carrey, and I thought all these people. I bet they've had mental illnesses, and oh, we're all right. Jim Carrey stated he was on Prozac for a long time. Dave Chappelle had a mental breakdown, disappeared to Africa. Will Ferrell has dis- dissociative personality disorder, and Ben Stiller has bipolar. So, and I, I thought I, I didn't carry on because I knew all of them probably were going to go down the same road. But, but 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 was it was it that they had these illnesses, or was it that they were selling these illnesses? I don't know. Maybe both, because Ben Stiller selling the rusty tank stuff, weren't he? Yeah, yeah. He went over there yeah. and shook that pig in his hand. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, you gave him an Oscar, didn't you? You gave him an Oscar. You gave him his Oscar. Yeah, you gave him his... <laughs> ben Stiller did, or was that um, Sean oh, was Penn? It, was it Sean Penn or Ben Stiller? Might be... I don't know which one. I've lost, I've lost track. Wait, or it Bono. Be, it might, it might, yeah, it uh, or are they Bo- the same people? Bono who looks weirdly <laughs> like Sean Penn. Who look, literally looks like an old woman if you put a blue ring swig on. <laughs> it might even be that plumber. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> Rod Stewart's ass. <laughs> <laughs> Just to close off on the Blunt family, uh, Emily's uncle is Crispin Jeremy Rupert Blunt MP. Uh, Blunt married Victoria Jenkins in September 1990 in Kensington, and they have a daughter and a son. In August 2010, he announced that he was leaving his wife in order to come to terms with his homosexuality. In January 2016, he stated that he used poppers during a parliamentary debate. I don't know whether it was during the parliamentary debate that he used poppers or that he was discussing them. And they discussed banning them along with other legal highs. He stated, I out myself as a user of poppers. I'm astonished to find the government is proposing it to be banned. And frankly, so would many other gay men. Matt Damon, guess what? His dad isn't a plumber. 100% isn't a plumber. Matt Page Damon. Um, he was ranked as one of Forbes, and I don't know what this means, but most bankable stars and and one of the highest grossing actors of all time. Just from nowhere, Chris. But his dad was a stockbroker and a film producer. But he came from nowhere. Yeah. Struggled his way to the top. Yeah, just fought his way to the top. And here he is at the World Economic yeah, Forum. Yeah, before you show this, this, this um, he's showing that video. No, I want to do that. Oh. No, because I just noticed on this video, he's going to show in a minute. He's got Klaus Schwab, and you can see he's basically very excited that Matt Damon's there, that he's gathering of psychos. But if you just watch, watch when Matt Damon says something, and he's laughing. He's laughing, and he's kind of looking around, and he, you know, he wants everyone to know that he's got Matt Damon there. But there's a guy to his left or You're right. You're very camp, then. <laughs> there's, a guy, there's a guy to his left or right. I'll let you with a fucking microphone. Uh, That's more manly. There's a guy to his left or right, and he's looking at him like he wants his approval. And this guy's just on his phone while Matt Damon's talking. And I just thought it looked a bit odd. I, I'd be interested to know what anyone thinks. Just what you saw that bit of video. US actor Matt Damon received an award at the World Economic Forum in Davos on Tuesday night in his capacity as co-founder of Water.org. The American non-profit organization is committed to providing safe drinking water and sanitation to people in the developing world. In his speech at a ceremony honoring him and three other artists, Damon jokingly thanked the Hollywood Foreign Press Association for the big honor. This is a really, really big honor, and I want to thank the Hollywood Foreign Press Association. (laughs) Wait, sorry, that's the wrong speech. (laughs) This is the Golden Globe speech I never got to give. (laughs) 
I know I didn't win, but to be honest, I kind of want, want to give this speech anyway. It's pretty good. There's this part where I talk about what it was like working with Michael Douglas, and I get kind of emotional. It's really good. And then I get a big kiss from Bono. Anyway, I don't know. I'll do that next year, maybe. Um, <clears throat> I've got a different speech I want to give tonight. Um, this really is a great honor to receive the Crystal Award. On a more serious note, Damon asked the audience of the world's political and business elite to get on board. We are just getting started, and we need you on board. Because access to water, fundamental as that is, is not an end in itself. Access to water is access to education, access to work, access above all to the kind of future we want for our own families and all the members of our human family. Thank you again. The annual Crystal Award ceremony traditionally marks the opening of the WEF and is hosted by Hilda Schwab, co-founder of the Schwab Foundation for Social Entrepreneurship and wife of WEF founder Klaus Schwab. Other recipients of this year's award were Peruvian tenor Juan Diego Flores and Munich Philharmonic conductor Lauren Mazal. The Crystal Awards honor artists whose important contributions are improving the state of the world, according to the WEF. Damon went to Harvard, uh, Damon or Demon, went to Harvard University. Um, and he was a member of the Del Delphic Club, which is one of the final select clubs, a bit like the Bullingdon Club. Um, an all-male social group, um, and goats. Um, it's like goats there, Chris. Matt Damon is a direct descendant of Mayflower passenger Richard Warren, the signer of the Mayflower Compact, the first governing document of the Plymouth colony, and the legendary buffalo hunter. You might have known him. <laughs> Pony Express rider and, sh and showman Buffalo Bill. So he's related to Buffalo Bill as well. Oh, and did I mention that his bloodline goes back to Edward III? It's a highly influential Plantagenet bloodline of Edward III. And the 21st great-grandparent of Matt Damon is Edward III. He also descends Edward Henry II, King Robert I, J.P. Morgan, Benedict Arnold, a relation of the Huxleys, Alan Foster Dulles, uh, and Foster Dulles, the CIA uh, starters. Boris Johnson's his eighth cousin once removed. Ninth cousin of David Chapman, as I mentioned earlier, and the Bushes, and Walt Disney and Taylor Swift, and is the 19th cousin of King Charles. She's quite connected, I'd say. Um, and finally, he's the 10th cousin of his best mate, Ben Affleck, as well, who we went to school with. And they both uh, started two production companies with uh, Ben Affleck and Damon did. And Damon's involved in his charitable work, as he was talking about there, which I'm gonna go into now. This is a bit of a detour. The one campaign which he was talking about here uh, was founded by Bobby Shriver III and Bono, along with a coalition of 11 non-profit humanitarian and advocacy organizations, including Oxfam and Bread for the World. Funding was also provided by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Shriver is not really a Shriver. He's actually from the Kennedy family. He's a nephew of JFK and RFK. In addition to one's long-term relationship with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the campaign is also funded through partner organizations like Apple, or Tapple, if you're from Yorkshire, uh, Bank of America. Bank of America is that one where Ed from Out of Light goes on about it being that yeah, sonic entrance, yeah, isn't it? You've got yeah. the sonic pictures. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Bloomberg, uh, Cargill, no, uh, uh, Caterpillar Foundation, Coca-Cola, Ford Foundation, Google, Merck, Roche, Rockefeller Foundation, Etc. Etc. and the Skoll Foundation and Open Societies. So that's who he's selling. He's selling all these people here. And Salesforce are also a part of it, which was founded by a former Oracle guy, and I've mentioned this in another podcast, Mark Benioff. Um, and it's now the 61st largest company in the world. And he was also, what I'm finding as well, a lot of these people are young global leaders. So the guy that started Salesforce was a young global leader. Oracle, he came from Oracle that was started by the CIA, because the guy that started Oracle, um, Larry, whatever he's called, he worked for a company that was doing a CIA program, and he jumped ship from that company, and the program was called Oracle, and his first customers were the CIA. And Oracle now run all the technology within the British government and most of the governments in, in the world. So who's running them? I can only guess. The Skoll Foundation, set up by Jeffrey Skoll, who was one of the funders, um, he was, it was set up by the, he was ex-president of eBay and whose founder, Pierre Audemars, was also a young global leader. And 
in 2016, Skoll, along with Bono and the investment firm TPG, co-founded the RISE Fund. There's a lot of these, that's RISE as in R-I-S-E, with a two billion social impact fund, um, a series of strict metrics by which measure social impact. <laughs> RISE has invested in more than 25 growth stage companies that are making a measurable, positive social and environmental impact. Bollocks. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't read the literature, Chris. Uh, Skoll owns Participant Films, and if you've seen us talking about this before, Participant Films, I think it's closed down now, actually. Um, they made films about, like, for social ac uh, camp action campaigns. Um, and he made, they made Al Gore's uh, film, An Inconvenient Truth, uh, which won an Academy Award. Syriana for George Clooney and Matt Damon, um, which Clooney won an Academy Award. And in 2011, they, the participant made, they produced the film Contagion with all those, uh, well, basically the same thing as what happened in 2020. Well, uh, it made Inconvenient Truth too as well. Oh, Even fantastic. None of the first one came true. <laughs> he won an Oscar, made millions out of it, and he made a sequel as well. Got a hockey no, stick, no, no dogs, sorry. No dogs, sorry. <laughs> We're joking. <laughs> 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 Should like she wanted to kill us then. No, no. <laughs> oh, dog, oh, dog did. Dog did <laughs> attack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. An assassin dog. Yeah, and is it inconvenient truth? None of it came true. Literally, none of it. I think Maldives were supposed to be underwater. I think London was supposed to be underwater. Yeah. Nothing happened. Um, well, e even in the blurb that it says, it says in 2020, following the 91 COVID 19 <laughs> pandemic, media coverage noted it was shockingly in its accuracy. Accuracy. So contagion. Yeah, yeah, contagion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, um, all those nut jobs, I'm sure. Didn't Wankok say that as well? Yeah, he, 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 that, he said he it? took some of the things they were doing from the film <laughs> Contagion. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't make it up, could you? But I mean, I mean I'm sure a lot of those not, did. I mean, we went through Contagion with a fine tooth comb, everybody did. And you could see all the parallels. I think they'd mentioned lockdown, everything was in that, wasn't it? Social, Social distancing, the lot. Just out of interest and for a brief break, I'm going to play the Contagion trailer just to show you what the like for like um, exhibit, if you like, that it was played out in 2020. Exactly the same. It was a groundbreaking ceremony for a new factory. Did she mention seeing anyone who was sick? Anyone on a plane at the airport? No, she said she was jet lagged. The average person touches their face three to five times every waking minute. In between, we're touching doorknobs, water fountains, and each other. Matt! Mom? No, no, uh, uh, go up to your room, honey. So we have a virus with no treatment protocol and no vaccine at this time. You had a seizure this morning, Beth. She had a history of seizures? No, no, no. no. Allergies? As of last night, there were 32 cases. Unfortunately, she did die. Right. And I said, can I go talk to her? Mr. Amoff, your wife is dead. What are you talking about? Okay. What happened to her? What happened to her? Is there any way someone could weaponize the bird flu? Is that what we're looking at? Someone doesn't have to weaponize the bird flu. The birds are doing that. Watch this. It's transmission, so we just need to know which direction. On day one, there were two people, and then four, and then 16. In three months, it's a billion. That's where we're headed. They're calling out the National Guard. They're moving the president underground. People will panic. Get away! It will tip over. The truth is being kept from the world. Cook your samples, destroy everything. Hello. I need you to get me the names of everyone who serviced this room. It's an emergency. You can't panic now. I know. I'm gonna get you home. I got people too, Dr. Cheever. We all do. Don't talk to anyone. Don't touch anyone. Stay away from other people. We're back in your car. We're not sick! It's figuring us out faster than we're figuring it out. It's mutated. Just 
just a slight interlude here from the actual live show. I just want to add some more information uh, that always crops up as we're going back through and editing these uh, videos, or when I'm editing these videos. As always in these presentations, for the benefit of time, we edit out information as we go along, uh, either knowingly or unknowingly, uh, just to give the overall picture um, during the presentation as the best we can. But anyway, um, I just want to point out two of the recent CEOs of the One campaign. Uh, in March 2017, uh, a lady called Gail Smith was named as president and CEO of the One campaign. Smith was formerly a co coordinator of the Global COVID Response and Health Security at the US Department of State and was the former administrator of the United States Agency for International Development called USAID. From 1998 to 2001, she was special assistant to Bill Clinton and senior director of for African Affairs at the US National Security Council. Smith was also the chairman of the Working Group Chair on Global Poverty for the Clinton Global Initiative, which is another NGO. In 2009, Smith joined the US National Security Council, where she was special assistant to President Obama. Smith has also worked as a consultant to various non-governmental agencies like Cooperation Canada, formerly the Canadian Council for International Cooperation. She's also worked for UNICEF and the World Bank, among others. As I said earlier, on March 5th, 2021, it was announced that Smith would be the coordinator of the Global COVID Response and Health Security at the US Department of State, where she focused on COVID financing, capacity, and global efforts to distribute COVID vaccines equitably. As part of this program, Smith worked on the 2021 COVAX investment opportunity and approach to funding uh, the World Health Organization COVAX facility, which provides jib jabs to low and to middle income countries. And just to reiterate who these people are who are running these NGOs and how their links to the security agencies, just bear in mind that she worked for three presidents there. There is no allegiance to red or blue in America with these people. They're working for another behind the scenes government, I suppose the hidden hand or whatever we want to call them. Smith is a member of the Rockefeller Setup Acumen Fund Incorporated, a non-profit impact investment fund uh, which partners with the International Finance Corporation of the World Bank and Dow Chemicals Venture Fund. She's also a member of the Africa America Institute, which was funded by the CIA and was and the CIA was centrally involved in the AAI's affairs for nearly a decade, providing the majority of funds spent by the Institute in the period of the mid-50s and 60s. The Center for, she's also a member of the Center for the New American Security, CNAS, which, and the donors for this organization, this think tank and NGO, include North, Northrop Grumman Aerospace Systems, Open Societies, that's George Soros, Airbus Group, the Boeing Company, Chevron Corporation, Lockheed Martin, Raytheon and the United States Government, BAE Systems, BP America and Exxon Mobil Corporation. And she's also a board member of the Council on Foreign Relations, which is another Rockefeller setup. So she's working for all these corporations and working for one campaign with Bono, Matt Damon, etc. and all these supposed stars. On April 2024, a lady by the name of Nadide uh, Nuelli uh, was named president of, and CEO of the One Campaign. She's an American stroke Nigerian entrepreneur, or social entrepreneur as I like to call them now. Again, this is the impact investment fund set up NGO type business people that the World Economic Forum talk about. She's an expert on African agriculture and nutrition, philanthropy, and social innovation. Indeed, is career began in her junior year at the University of Pennsylvania when she held a summer business analysis position at McKinsey and Company. Again, another company that always pops up in research and it seems to have close links to government intelligence and the dark, other dark agencies that seem to uh, be lurking in the background. In 1999, Ndidi worked, for, worked as a lead consultant for the Ford Foundation on a project focusing on Nigeria's largest microcredit institution or institutions. Uh, 
In 2002, she founded two non-profits, LEAP and NIA, and she's been invited to speak at the UN Commission for Social Development and the World Economic Forum. She's also spoken at the Clinton Global Initiative. LEAP has worked in partnership with the Ford Foundation, CTI Foundation, which is the huge bank, Citigroup, uh, the World Bank, the United States Government, UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and a group called ALE, or ALI, which is part of the Aspen Institute's African Leadership Initiative. And the Aspen Institute has close ties with American intelligence and military. She was, not surprisingly, selected as a global leader of tomorrow by the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab in Davos in 2002. The global leaders of tomorrow was the precursor to the Young Global Leader Programme. And obviously, they changed the name because I think it gave too much away. It were actually telling us who the global leaders of tomorrow would be. But she was also selected as a Young Global Leader by the World Economic Forum in Davos in 2004-2005. And in that intake in 2005, there were some interesting characters that were also on the Young Global Leaders roster. Uh, Justin Trudeau, future Prime Minister, dictator of Canada. Um, he was part of the, and he was part of the, probably the hardest rules of ninety one Divok in the in the world. Ed Balls, uh, another leading figure in the Labour Party, uh, he was also a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader. Uh, as was Yvette Cooper, who was also um, part of the uh, Labour government or Labour uh, Party. On that. Uh, on that year's intake was Mark Benioff. I mentioned him in this presentation, who was CEO of Salesforce. Um, and he uh, owns a cloud uh, computing company. Uh, and uh, he was definitely a 91 divot uh, on side with all that. Sergey Brin, co-founder of Google, was on there. Um, we, we, we know that Google was also um, playing the same game. Uh, Justin Trudeau's partner in crime, who we've covered in a, a podcast years ago, or two or three years ago, Christia Freeland, who had links to back to Nazi Germany. Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, was also on there. So very influential. Gavin Newsom, you know, he was governor of California, um, who, again, in 2020 and 2021, he, man, he, made, he decreed mandatory uh, jib jabs for all school children in 2021. Uh, Nathaniel Rothschild uh, in 2005 was a young global leader. I could go on. Um, there was quite a lot of people on that intake and all of a sudden we're seeing these people and some of these people aren't just young global leaders, they're uh, Bilderbergers, etc. And all of them were key members and mouthpieces for what happened in 2021. And just one last thing about Indini. And in 2019, she became a board member of the Rockefeller Foundation. So this has just given you an insight into who's running these NGOs with, as I said earlier, uh, Bono and all these other people that are telling us they're doing all this fantastic work for poor developing countries that just seem to have the lifeblood sucked out of them. Current members of the One Board uh, include former Prime Minister David uh, William Baron Cameron of Chippewa Norton. Uh, he's a member of the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, Friends for Israel, and he's a descendant of King Henry the Seventh and William the Fourth, and George the uh, Third, and Lawrence Summers. I mean, you might have heard us mention him before. He's a young global leader in '93, president of Harvard. If you watch the film uh, Social Network, was it about yeah, Face, Network, yeah. Face Crook? Yeah, um, he was the governor, governor, president of Harvard at the time, and he was the one that the supposed Zuckerberg went in to see to start the. No, he, he, created, he created Facebook in his dorm while, oh, was, sorry, while he was yeah. at college. With them yeah, drawings, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, Get with it, Doc. Well, also, the other director of uh, Face Crook was uh, Cheryl Sandberg, and she's a director there as well. And sh she's a young global leader of 2007, um, as was Zuckerberg as well. Um, and also, Bono is on the board, and he was a young global leader in 93, uh, with Blair and Brown at the same time, and Bill Gates, and Merkel, Sarkozy, and Branson. I don't think he had his pearl necklace on, though. <laughs> <laughs> I've been trying to find that podcast, you know, because people ask us. Have, has anybody listened to that pearl necklace podcast? Yeah? yeah. Can't find it. I'm going to have to find it. I don't know where it is. Yeah. 
So you can see the links to these innocuous NGOs that are coming through with all these people involved with hundreds of millions of dollars that actually achieve absolutely nothing. There's another one called Water Org that is involved with set it up with a and water partners and H2O Africa Foundation. Just to yeah. using these characters, yeah, using these actors who have got these distinct bloodlines within there. And then we come to this guy here. Um, I don't know if you've seen this guy before, um, Peter Brabeck Letethme, um, ex CEO of Nestle. Um, yeah, former chairman of, of Nestle as well, uh, Nestle Group. Um, he, he's got links to the CIA as well because he was part of Nestle in the 70s or 80s when the CIA overthrew uh, or conducted a coup against the um, government in Chile. And a lot of the big corporations who were there um, helped the CIA. Nestle was one of them while he was on the board of directors. So he would have known rough what was going on. Um, He's also on the board of Credit Suisse, L'Oreal, ExxonMobil. In addition, he's a founder and chairman of the 2030 Water Resources Group. Nothing dodgy there. A public-private partnership, Chris. <laughs> That's all it is. Incorporated as part of the World Bank. What Chile like the that was the, the test case, wasn't it, for economically taking over countries? Yeah. Yeah, and probably. So he, yeah. He, he was, wasn't it? He was quite, quite well known. Mm. And now he's come up with the 2030 Water Resources Group. Yeah, Nestle. Uh, yeah, what could go wrong there? They want your water. <laughs> yeah. Um, and it was that that 2030 Water Group was launched at the World Economic Forum in da in Davos. And they're all the sponsors, or some of the sponsors, Coca Cola and Nestle, obviously. Was it him who said it's, your water's not right? Was yeah, it, we're gonna. We, we're just gonna read that. You can read it now. <laughs> there you go. Is this him? Water is, of course, the most important raw material we have in today's world. It's a question of whether we should privatise the normal water supply for the population. And there are two different opinions on this matter. Not really. The one opinion, uh, which I think is extreme, is represented by the NGOs who bang on about declaring water as public right. That means that as a human being, you should have a right to water. Sounds fair. That's an extreme solution, right? <laughs> the other view says that water is a foodstuff like any other. Like any other foodstuff, it should have a market value. Personally, I believe it's better to give a foodstuff a value so that we're all aware of its price. And then that one should take specific measures for the part of the population that has no access to this water. And there are many different possibilities there. But what a wanker. But yeah, well, he is, but do, 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 do you see what, what he's doing there, though? He's saying the NGOs say water is a public right. He's part of the NGOs. Yeah. So the, 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 the it's just that silly, no, it's, it's, it's that silly argument that they've got going backwards and forwards. But then they've, they've brought that into the public domain. Exactly, yes. And they, they use what they call venture philanthropy. Um, and these people do not give anything away. Nothing ever, ever gets given away for free. Nothing ever gets resolved. And, and venture phil philanthropy is a type of impact investment that takes the techniques of normal venture capitalism, where they invest in companies uh, and businesses, and applies them to charities achieving uh, philanthropic goals. So, so for instance, if someone here says, I'm going to set this charity up, you get 10 companies like Coca-Cola to invest, but the Coca-Cola are buying the intellectual property rights of whatever they're coming up with. Yeah, so there's a market value of that. So what they perceive is that by investing in that company, they're getting banged for the book, but it might sort something out for the public, which it never does, yeah? But there's always a value there. Because intellectual property rights, like I'll use sheep farm. Sheep farm, let's just say there's a value to it. There's, that's investable then. Once there's a value to it, it's investable. It might have no value to anybody else, but it's investable. That's where all money gets floated in. It's a, it's a scam. It's basically a, a, a scam and it, nothing ever gets resolved. The term was first used in 1969 by John Rockefeller III, funnily enough, to describe an imaginative risk-taking approach to philanthropy that may be undertaken by charitable organizations. Just like cancer research, it's got something like 700 million pounds worth of assets because it invests in startup businesses that say they've got a cure. 
that them saying they've got a cure or a, a treatment increases the value of that asset. Uh, my wife used to work in a bank and look after business, and all the charities always had millions of pounds in the bank, yet they're still raising money. I just want to take a moment to uh, talk about a couple of people that I mentioned over the last five, ten minutes when we were discussing Matt Damon and his charities. One of those was Lawrence Summers, or Larry Summers. Um, he is an operative, I would say. Uh, he was a professor by the time he was 28 at Harvard. Um, he was a close friend of Jeffrey Epstein and a member of the passengers on various times on the Lolita Express. He's a member of the 21st Century Council, the Atlantic Council board member. He's a Bilderberger. In fact, he's on the steering committee. He's part of the Brookings Institution, the Council on Foreign Relations member group, a group of 30. He's on the Henry Jackson and Henry Jackson, Jackson Initiative. He's part of the Tri Trilateral Commission Task Force on Global Capitalism in Transition, and he was a WEF, Global Leaders for Tomorrow, member in 1993. In an anonymous document published by American intelligence media, it stated that Larry Summers, then Harvard president, was in charge of a government-sponsored military weaponization of cyber warfare project that gave rise to Facebook. He wrote in the article that Larry Summers called Mark, that's Mark Zuckerberg, into the office in early, early in his freshman year. Summers asked Mark to start a group to work on a social media project, a supposed competition among teachers and students to win a government contract. The goal was to create a social media directory and Harvard where people could share in small groups. The real intent was to create a social media network to manipulate the world. Summers was also chief economist to the World Bank. These are the players that are playing. And one of his uh, statements that he's said over his time is that there are two kinds of politicians, insiders and outsiders. The outsiders prioritise their freedom to speak their version of the truth. The price of their freedom is that they are ignored by the insiders who make the important decisions. The insiders, he went on, are obedient to an unbreakable code of conduct. conduct. Never turn against other insiders and don't talk to outsiders about what the insiders say or do. In return, the insiders get access to, to inside information and a chance to influence people and outcomes. He's been a member of the Bilderbergers since 1998. And obviously, he's been part of the World Economic Forum since 2004. In fact, he's been since before that, since the early 90s. So we have to ask, who is this guy actually working for? Now, the program that was running before Facebook was called LifeLog. And LifeLog was a DARPA project aimed to gather a single pit single place just about everything an individual says sees or does the phone calls made the tv shows watched the magazines read the plane tickets bought and the emails sent and received lifelog aimed to compile a massive electronic database of every activity and relationship a person engages in this was to include credit card purchases websites visited the content of telephone calls and emails sent and received, scans of faxes and postal mail sent and received, instant messages sent and received, books and magazines read, television and radio selections, physical location recorded via wearable GPS sensors, biomedical data captured through wearable sensors. The high level goal of the data login was to identify preferences, plans, goals and other markers of intentionality. Another of DARPA's goals for LifeLog had a predictive function. It sought to find meaningful patterns in the timeline to infer the user's routines, habits and relationships with other people, organisations, places and objects and to exploit these pat patterns to ease its task. Sounds a bit like AI. LifeLog was to integrate components from previous and new government intelligence and surveillance programmes including other programmes like Genoa, Genoa 2 and Genesis. These were other programmes that were running prior to LifeLog, 
Project Genoa was a software project commissioned by the US, or DARPA, which was designed to analyze large amounts of data, and metadata, remind me of anything, to help humans, a human analysis, counter terrorism. Project Genoa researchers set mock up, mock up crisis command center in DARPA's main building, full of monitors staffed by actors, actors, an audience would watch as fictitious scenarios would unfold before them, guided along by an anim animated video segment. John Poindexter called the presentation a day in the life of an analyst. Another mock center was set up near Dar the DARPA building with the help of a Hollywood set designer to serve the same purpose. Project De Genoa 2 was scheduled to be a five year long uh, program. Its mission was or the official goals of Genoa 2 were to develop and deploy cognitive aids that allow humans and machines to think together in real time. Means to overcome the biases and limitations of the human cognitive system. Cognitive amplifiers that help teams of people rapidly and fully comprehend complicated and uncertain situations. And lastly, the means to rapidly and seamlessly cut across and complement existing stovepiped hierarchical organizational structures by creating dynamic, adaptable, peer-to-peer -peer collaborative networks. DARPA said it was closing the LifeLog program down because of a change of priorities. Reports in the media described LifeLog as the diary to end all diaries, a multimedia digital record of everywhere you go and everything you see, hear, read, say and touch. According to the US government official, Records, LifeLog is not connected with DARPA's Total Information Awareness Program, which means it is connected which means it is connected to DARPA's Total Information Awareness Program. Its goal was to integrate components from previous new government intelligence and surveillance programs, including Genoa 2, sorry, Genoa, Genoa 2, Genesis, SSNA, Double E L D, W A E E, or Way. TIDES, Communicator, Human ID and Biosurveillance and data mining knowledge gleaned from the private sector to create a resource for the intelligence and counterintelligence and law enforcement communities. Research included or planned to include the participation of nine government entities, INSCOM, NSA, DIA and the CIA. Universities were enlisted to assist with the research and development, and these included Berkeley, Colorado State, Carnegie Mellon, Columbia, Cornell, Dallas, Georgia Tech, Maryland, MIT, and Southampton. Its goal was to revolutionize the US's ability to detect, classify, and identify foreign terrorists and decipher their plans, thereby enabling the US to take timely action to preempt and disrupt terrorist activity, pre-crime. The LifeLog program was apparently cancelled on February 3rd, 2004, after criticism, no shit, concerning the privacy implications of the system. Facebook was founded on February 4th, 2004. So what is Facebook or Meta, Meta now? And who is Zuckerberg? He went to Harvard, which gets funding from DARPA. And just to finish off this little interlude, I want to talk about Sheryl, Sheryl Sandberg, uh, the ex-CEO of Facebook uh, since 2008 until 2022, uh, for about 14 years. The story goes, if you believe it, that in late 2007, Zuckerberg, CEO, CEO of Facebook, met Sandberg at a Christmas, Christmas party held by Dan Rosenberg, a board member of Yahoo. Zuckerberg wasn't even looking for a chief operating officer, but thought Sandberg was a perfect fit for this role. And given her background with Larry Summers, I think she was put into this role, don't you? Sandberg is an American business executive, billionaire, philanthropist. What else? Sandberg is the CEO, or was the CEO, of Meta Platforms, ex Facebook, and founder of Leanin.org. Leanin.org is an NGO funded by, founded by, um, Sandberg in 2013 and dedicated to offering women the ongoing inspiration and support to help them achieve their goals. Professor Larry Summers, who became a mentor and thesis advisor while she was at Harvard at the same time as Zuckerberg, so it wasn't like they were strangers, 
She worked in the Clinton administration, direct, working directly for Lawrence Summers in the US Department of the Treasury. Summers recruited her to be his research assistant at the World Bank, where she worked for approximately one year on health projects in India, dealing with leprosy, AIDS and blindness. She became, uh, she was named to the board of the Walt Disney Com Company in 2009. Sandberg was named one of the most 25 influential people on the web by Business Week in 2009. In 2013, she was ranked the world's in the world's most in the world's 50th most influential Jews, conducted by the Jerusalem Post. And her husband died suddenly, mysteriously, on a treadmill. In, I think it was a treadmill in 2015. One role she had was a board, being a board member on the Paley Media Council. Before 2007, it was known as the Museum of Television and Radio International Council. A membership community comprised of the world's most important entertainment, media and technology executives. It was actually founded in 1975 by a chap called William Pauley, an American businessman, involved in the media and best known as the chief executive of Columbia Broadcasting System, or CBS. And he built it from a small radio network to the huge corporation it is now. But during World War II, Pauley was director of radio operations for the psychological warfare branch of the Office of War Information at Allied Force Headquarters in London, where he held the rank of Colonel. Members of this group also included British MP Jeremy Hunt, who we all loved, Robert Gates, who was former US Secretary of Defence, Director of CIA, and Chairman of the National Intelligence Council, Sir Tony B. Lyre, Angelina Jolie, who was a member of the CFR and World Economic Forum, and last but not least, the now deceased Sir Henry A. Kissinger. She, all, she was also a board member of the Brookings Institution, another American think tank that con con conducts research and education in the social sciences, primarily in economics, metropolitan policy, governance, foreign policy, global economy, economic development. And it's funded by Bill and Melinda Foundation, Climate Works Foundation that want less people on the planet, the Rockefellers, etc., etc. Oh, and just to finish off, she was a young global leader in 2007. She she was there when Peter Thiel was there, another billionaire who was part of the PayPal Mafia, and Jimmy Wales, or James Wales, not the radio guy, but James Wales who came up with Wikipedia, and his wife as well. His wife was there. She was called Garvey, I forget now. She was Tony Blair's advisor while he was in office. But anyway, and she's worth a cool $2 billion. Okay, and just to continue, speaking of DARPA that I mentioned about oh, two, three, four, five minutes ago, whatever it was, and the type of controlled assets that are put into place and out into the ether also includes the business world. These Manchurian candidate-like programs also recruit or seem, seemingly recruit individuals who set up businesses from their garages, which does happen. Um, but they're not, never really taken to that size of these corporations that then go on to change society. As we know it this never happens by chance because far too much is at stake for the controllers to allow this to happen by chance one of these manchurian manchurian entities is jeff bezos or bezos founder of amazon again seemingly benign and organic until they start to pull back the carpet or carpets Jeff Bezos was a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader of Tomorrow, class of 1998. The Young Global Leaders of Tomorrow was the forerunner of today's Young Global Leaders. He looks like another harmless, cross-eyed, geekazoid bookworm who started selling books online. And then boom, Amazon is now one of the biggest companies in the world. Although I haven't yet found a royal blood lineage, uh, what I can see is a constant link back to the intelligence agencies and generational operations that seem to go on for decades. Bezos is no different from Gates, although Gates does have a royal lineage. So I'll take you through this little explanation here. Jeff Bezos' mother was Jacqueline Bezos, maiden name Guise, G-I-S-E. Her father, Bezos' maternal grandfather, was a man called Lawrence P. Guise. Guise just happened to be the director of the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, so when President Harry Truman signed the McMahon Atomic Energy Act in on August the first, nineteen forty-six, transferring the control of the atomic energy 
from military to civilian hands, which was effective on January 1st, 1947. Guys would have been around 32 year old at that point. But here's where it gets a little bit deeper. It also turns out that LP Guys was named as Deputy Director of the Advanced Research Projects Agency, a.k.a. ARPA, by Di Director of Defence Research and Engineering, Dr. Herbert F. York, who, during World War II, was working alongside Frank Oppenheimer, there's that name again, as part of the Manhattan Project, or the Manhattan Project. York became the first chief scientist of the Advanced Research Projects Agency, ARPA, and the first director of the Defence Research and Engineering Agency. York and Guys were two of the co-founders of DARPA that grew out of ARPA, of whom they were both directors. I'll repeat that. Jeff Bezos' grandfather, Lawrence Guys, was a co-founder of DARPA. DARPA then went on to build LifeLog, that I've just mentioned, that then became Facebook. All of these programs I mentioned earlier, like ARPANET, and Genoa 1 and 2, and Project Total Awareness, and all the other projects that were running, were all devised by ARPA. Oh, sorry, DARPA. Set up by Jeff Bezos's dad. And then Jeff Bezos sets up one of the world's biggest online businesses. Remember, ARPANET was really the first internet devised in the 60s, I do believe, or 70s anyway. This is where these people come from. And there is no, <laughs> the, no plumbers. No plumbers allowed, I'm afraid, in this. Oh, yeah. And just to add a little bit more uh, to this, uh, Jeff Bezos has attended Bilderberger meetings. I think he's attended two Bilderberger meetings as well. So, there we go. Right, let's get back on with the live part of the show. Sorry, ladies. You're not going to like George Clooney after this. <laughs> He's got slightly dead eyes, George Clooney, I think. Yeah. As years have gone by. Yeah. Odd. Odd. Probably because he married that bloke. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. <laughs> George and Andy Clooney. Yeah. <laughs> A man Clooney. Yeah. Uh, her father... Um, he's part of the Lebanese Druze uh, from the Alam al-Din dynasty uh, in Lebanon. And she's a L Lebanese barrister. And she's had some interesting go uh, government jobs. Um, she specialised in international law, apparently, and human rights. And her clients, there's a long list of people and causes uh, that are promoted by Western governments. So she, with, uh, like, working for the por uh, foreign policy, uh, sorry, foreign office. Um, she represented Julian Assange with Amal Clooney. Um, and I don't know what that means. I don't know what Julian Assange is. Maybe she was a handler or something like that. But she was appointed special envoy on music, media, freed, media freedom by the British Foreign and Commonwealth Office. That's his wife. She's obviously married to George Clooney, who himself has done work as a frontman for the US intelligence services and human in humanitarian wars, notably in Sudan. In 2011's Clooney campaign for support for the independence referendum in South Sudan, Clooney conceived of and with John Prendergast, human rights activist, initiated the Satellite Sentinel Project, which sounds very intelligence oriented, Both Enough Project and Not On Our Watch Project. They're, meant, they're major projects of George Soros's and his Center for American Progress, a think tank funded by Gates, BAE Systems, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin. These are the people he's working for. But he's going for peace, working for armament companies. Um, uh, it also receives donations from Rockefeller Foundation, Carnegie Foundation, the Schwab Charitable Fund, yada, yada, yada. In 2021, Clooney made it very clear he's fully behind the mandatory COVID-19 vaccines in every walk of life. Clooney didn't see the issue as something which is open for discussion. I think every, com every company should do it. All the people who want to talk about their independence and their freedom, the minute your freedom infringes on everyone else's, should put a stop to it. 
same shite. Yes. Yeah. Um, his wife Amel worked for a big uh, law firm called Sullivan and Cromwell, uh, which is part of the Council on Foreign Relations, and it's a corporate member of them. And people who've worked there, Alan Foster, Alan Dull Dulles, director of CIA, James Corbett, um, summarized Dulles, and I think he summed it up pretty well. A, dip uh, a diplomat, spy, Wall Street lawyer, philanderer, government overthrow specialist, Nazi collaborator, MK Ultra overlord, presidential assassin, and fascist spy master. He burst in. <laughs> There's a toilet at the back, you know. There's one at the back there. There's one there through that door, yeah. Not that way. It's like Mr. Ben. <laughs> you go out of the side dressed as an Indian. In 2013, she was appointed as to a number of United Nations uh, commissions. Oh, and yes, she was a World Economic Forum Young Global Leader in 2016. At the uh, same year, Emmanuel Macron, uh, ex Rothschild banker and Bilderberg, who was a uh, Young Global Leader as well. Does anybody know Macron worked at Rothschild Bank? Yeah? Well, worked there for a long time. Uh, the Clooney family, there's a real list. that goes. This goes back to that Julian Huxley thing as well. Father, Nicholas Clooney, American journalist and command television host. Aunts, Rose Clooney, American singer, actress. Betty Clooney, singer, TV presenter. Uh, Miguel Ferreira, um, he was, he didn't make chocolates, he was an uh, actor in Robocop. You remember him, don't you? Yeah, he was the guy who invented the robot, Robocop. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, his, uh, and his daughter, I think, plays uh, someone in Grey's Anatomy, Dr. Leah Murphy. Um, and she's the daughter and singer of Debbie Boone. Uh, Debbie and the Boone family, um, you remember Patrick Boone? I got called that a bit at school, Pat Boone. <laughs> Don't know what that reminded me of, uh, but meant to be reminded, <laughs> rhyme with, but. <laughs> I think, I think Miguel Josie, I think he died suddenly yeah, a couple of years yeah. ago. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So he, he also won Best Picture, uh, Dick Clooney, for uh, being a producer of Argo. Yeah, in 2012, yeah. literally, and CIA. Yeah. Um, so he would have had to work with the CIA on that, wouldn't he? Yeah. yeah. There's no doubt about that. Well, that goes a story about the CIA going, I forget where they go to another country. It's Iran, isn't it? Pretending to be a film crew, but they're right. all CIA. Right. Um, and he was Time Time Magazine's annual 100, 100 list. Time Magazine's a sponsor of uh, the. No, the owner of Time Magazine was a young global leader as well, uh, which. Yeah. He served in the United Nations, and Clooney is also a member of the Council for Foreign Relations, which I think I mentioned earlier. Yeah. Why would he need to be on Council for Foreign Relations if he's an actor? No need for that, is there, at all? Well, it's to drag people in, isn't it? Because yeah. uh, you trust them and listen to them, unfortunately. He, he shares a bloodline of the ancient Huguenot uh, bloodline, um, and many famous celebs, powerful people share it. Dom Jolly shares it. He's on the Hugo Nine, uh, as we're going to hopefully get into. We have time uh, later on. Um, not to be confused with the uh, French uh, Perechion uh, bloodline, which Trudeau, Madonna, uh, Lady Gaga, and all these other people share. It's a slightly different bloodline, is that? Oh, guys, feel a bit lighter? Yeah. Good, uh, good. <laughs> Yeah, but the U Huguenot bloodline is shared by Humphrey Bogart, Marlon Brando, Charlie Chaplin, who uh, Robert Downey Jr. played. Uh, Daniel Craig, he's got, Daniel Craig's got a royal bloodline as well. I'm not going to go into him today, but he has got a royal bloodline. John Crawford, Johnny Depp, he's got a royal bloodline. Richard Gere, River and Joachim Phoenix, and Charles Theron. Did you find it? Thanks. Yeah. And George S. Patton, Al Gore, Ian Fleming, and Alan Shepard, who we mentioned earlier, related to all the... Jeffrey Dahmer and stuff like that. There is, there is a toilet at the back, guys. There's one at the back. What have you been drinking? Pint. No, you want a pint. <laughs> yeah. Once you've got that pint in your head, you can't carry on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so all these people are linked in some way. I mean, I've, I do find that a bit odd, to be fair. Um, it might just be me, but a lot of people say genealogy, everyone's linked, but not, it's not what I found. It's not what you found either, Lorraine, is it? We're not all linked at all. Uh, we don't. We're not all go about related. Imagine if we're related to him. 
Uh. <laughs> Imagine if I won. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, just going back to the Apollo mission. I find I start looking into the Apollo mission before we get into uh, Tom Wanks. Um, and I mentioned that Alan Bartlett Shepherd and he was on Apollo 14, wasn't it? I don't know if I heard yeah. Um, he's a, he apparently hit two golf balls off the lunar surface. All oh, right, that, that, that's him. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> First thing you do, isn't it? Yeah. Right well, he, he, I mentioned earlier he's a descendant of Richard Warren or somebody else who, who, who wrote the first um, Mayflower Compact. Right. Yeah. It was, yeah, it yeah. was like the yeah. And and his ancestors, he obviously I mentioned John Wayne Gacy and Jeffrey Dam. He's also related to Elvis and Ernest Hemingway, and also Wells, people like that. And his grandfather owned Derry National Bank in Ireland. Serial killers seem to hold an important. Um, level in this mix, don't yeah. They? I'm sure they're going to start talking up. Um, and he's got a royal. Uh, so these guys that are going to space have all got these lineages as well. King Henry the Second and King Louis the Eighth of France. Um, so I, I'd start looking into Neil Armstrong, and he's got obviously the clan Armstrong in Scotland. And I think anyway, I, I only just started that one. But um, all, the, all these all these people have one thing in common: they can all just lie out, lie out, out of their teeth, can't yeah. they? So one thing that. Um, Jo back to Clooney, just for an instance, because it links to Tom Hanks. His great 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 grandmother, Mary Ann Sparrow, was the half sister of Nancy Lincoln, mother of President Lincoln. And we've also I've said to the story that Sherry Booth was related to John Wilkes Booth, who killed the President Lincoln. If that were true, I don't know, but anyway, that's the story. So this makes Lincoln, uh, ha ha sorry, Clooney and Lincoln, uh, half cousins, five times removed. She, Na Nancy Lincoln was also called Nancy Hanks Lincoln. Her grandfather was Joseph Hanks. He was the great grandfather of, of President Lincoln. It's generally accepted that Joseph was the father of Lucy Hanks, the mother of Nancy Hanks Lincoln, making George Clooney and Tom Hanks distant cousin. There he is with the Queen. Who would have guessed that? Is that Obama as well? That's Obama as well. Yeah. He, didn't he have a good time in a limo once? <laughs> <laughs> that was an interesting video, wasn't it? That that guy that stood up on that podium and told that story. Yeah, what was that about? Didn't get sued, nothing happened to him. Yeah. Odd story. Didn't he say he was doing drugs and giving him yeah, yeah, whatever? Yeah. He don't look like he could do that there, drinking that glass of champagne, does well, what, 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 why, why is Tom Hanks there with the Queen and Obama? I don't know. He's just, he's just an actor. Acting. So I'll play this video. I have a bit of a break. Um, we could pause that fight. Look at his face. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom Wanks. Is me. Yeah. Tom Wanks. Yeah. <laughs> He's in the vinegar stroke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Tom Wanks stars in the money shot. <laughs> Look at this newsreader on this um, on this this clip that, that I'm showing. Look at the newsreader. You, you just don't see human beings that look like this. These American newsreaders, um, rude. <laughs> uh, didn't get you one, did she, it? No, that's what I'm saying. Look at this newsreader. She looks like a thundercat. I remember we were sitting in the studio the day that the news broke that you and Rita had coronavirus. And I got to tell you, we sort of all had kind of a mini heart attack. It was scary for us because that was in the very beginning when we didn't know all the things about the coronavirus. How in that moment were you were you and Rita? Were you afraid? No, we were not because we were we were feeling extremely punky. I, I, I don't want to dismiss our, 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 uh, our symptoms. We felt rotten. Uh, I had body aches, crippling, cracking body aches. But what, was, what we were mostly concerned with is, was at the time, is what is next? They, the Australian officials put us, in, uh, put us in the hospital and they kept very strict attention on our fevers because if they had spiked we were going to be in trouble our lungs because if they had filled up or scarred we were going to be in trouble and the levels of our oxygen that was what they were doing for us but what were they doing for other people was making sure we weren't passing it along to anybody else we had the coronavirus we were giving it away to anybody that uh, came within distance to us and so we were 
uh, I can't, we, we were in awfully good hands. Right. And we were very much aware of that we were maybe exploring some brand new territories about the, the personal as well as the public versions of right. having COVID-19. Whether or not we like it, we're all in this together. We're all affected by this. So let's, at the very least, there's a lot of stuff you can do uh, beyond that. But at the very least, three tiny things are, is in everybody's wheelhouse if you choose to do them. Wear a mask, wash your hands, social distance. If you can't do that, I don't have much respect for you. It's pretty easy to do your part. If you, have, if you drive a car, you got to use your turn signal, not drive too fast and avoid pedestrians. Those are three things that should be pretty easy to do. And COVID-19, if we social distance, wear a mask and wash our hands, uh, we should we be able to get along. So let's do that. <laughs> Make you a bit angry, did it, Jeff? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Calm down, Jeff. Yeah, it makes your blood boil, doesn't it? He's a lying bastard. And ever, ever, you know, the, the lovely guy, nicest guy in Hollywood, Tom Hanks. Uh, no, he's a lying bastard. <laughs> you're feeling punk. You're feeling punky. Yeah, I'm feeling punky and kicky. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Crippling, crackling body aches, Chris. Just yeah. Everything crackling. you just said was a lie. Yeah, yeah, everything, lie. yeah. yeah. Crippling, crackling body aches. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Jesus, what did we live through then? Yeah, majorly. Um, but yeah, it, lo and behold, is related to um, more presidents than the US have got actually presidents, I think. Uh, more than I've got time to go through anyway. Presidents Washington, Lincoln, Bush, both Bushes, etc. Um, actor Steve McQueen, loads of other actors. Who was a Julie Garden, Garland, Liz, Liza Minnelli, David Crosby, uh, David Crosby. I've crossed by. Eighteenth great grandparent was Robert King Robert III, um, one of the Stuart family, out Royal House of Stuart. That's David Crosby, the hippie, um, and he's related to Tom Wanks. Um, Hanks is related to J.P. Morgan, Rockefeller, in fact, all the Rockefellers, and Anderson, Vanderbilt, Whitehead, CIA, Cooper. <laughs> Alfred, Regea, Alfred, the Great, Alfred the Great, William the Conqueror, Henry VIII, QE1 and 2, and others. All the, all the good ones, Charlemagne, you name it. Uh, yeah. So... That it can't be an accident. I just don't believe it's an accident. I'm not saying it's all totally controlled and somebody's writing all these names down, but some something's happening somewhere because j just in films. I mean, I know I've got this one up here, but the first one was Apollo 13. So that that Alan Shepard I mentioned earlier related to all them. He's related to Alan Shepard that, and he played Apollo 13. He's also related to Werner von Braun, who's also got a royal bloodline. I think back to Edward III and somebody else, and he's also related to another. Um, uh, th three people involved in NASA, he's related to it. It makes Apollo and he, 13. And he was selling the, um, the space bullshit, wasn't it? Yes. Like, uh, Tom yeah. Hanks. yeah. So uh, it did Philadelphia sold the AIDS uh, program, uh, Shaving Ryan's Privates. He's, he's done a lot of war films, hasn't he? Mm. Um, I think we went through his filmography and everything's, everything's uh, virtual signaling. Uh, system film, it seems, I would say. But but a lot of his films uh, that I noticed, and it didn't happen to a lot of the other people, uh, Shaving Ryan's Privates, Ted Danson were in it, Paul Giamatti, they're all cousins of his. Matt Damon is all cousin. Um, him, him and Spielberg do a lot of this film work together, don't they? Yeah. Just a bit. Yeah. But for even just Philadelphia, I mean, that terrified everybody, didn't it? The selling the AIDS thing. Um, does, it, does anyone know anyone who died of AIDS? Just out of interest. Put your hand up if you do. No one. <laughs> oh, sorry. All right. Yeah. No. Well, my my um my wife's friend's mother got diagnosed with HIV. She did, she never died of it. It's just curious that it was the biggest thing sold to us in the eighties. No one really seems to know anyone who who had it or died of it. Or, or not in or, or not enough numbers to warrant not the to amount warrant, of well, a bit like what we went through in twenty twenty. Yeah. Really, isn't it? Yeah. And our mum worked in a gay bar in the 80s. But wrote, wrote to Perdition, uh, William H. Macy were in it, and he's his 20th cousin. He was the guy in the hotel room that he killed. Yeah. So he assassinated his cousin in the film. Why would you not mention that? I mean, that, that one's even... This stranger. one's even stranger, yeah. The fact that he's related to that guy. 
Uh, yeah, they was in the film and they never mentioned it. Yeah, he found out afterwards apparently that it was related to this guy. Uh, what, it's not Ted Rogers. That's that three two one geezer, isn't it? Um, yeah, but is his sixth cousin anyway? Uh, Fred Rogers. Is, is Tom Hanks? Is he related to Ted Rogers? He, I don't know if he's related. <laughs> Dusty, I think he's related to Dusty Bin. <laughs> And it's funny he just did that. Remember that? Yeah. Hey, yeah. he's got through your one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> they did, yeah. Could never get it. No, no could do it. He's related to Disney. He played Disney in, uh, was it Mr. Banks or something like that? And he's uh, Disney's cousin. It looks like him. He does, yeah. 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 As did uh, Dame Emma Thompson were in that as well. Um, but yeah. But him and uh, Disney. Uh, he's, he's, a lot of his films were made by Disney as well, which mm. makes it even. And he, and he didn't know that he was related to Disney till afterwards again. <laughs> <laughs> really? Getting boring, Tom. Come yeah, on. I know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But it reminded me of Bene Benedict Cumberbatch, right? Name that in it, CBE uh, as well. It's funny you mentioned him, fact, because last night when I went back to my room, they were showing that film about the Enigma Code. Yeah, I've well, watched it before. Imitation Game, is it? Yeah, he uh, played Alan Turing, didn't he? Yeah. And yeah. he's he, they're actually related. What the Shannon Duke same yeah. lineage? Yeah, I can tell you a funny story about Benedict Cumberbatch. Uh, I can't say it on this podcast. So my my friend's wife does you know when they do film location scouting, and she was doing a location, and Benedict Cumberbatch was in the film, and he insisted on having a an electric car charger to charge his electric car. And they didn't have one, so they just put a fucking diesel generator on the back <laughs> and linked it to his charger. <laughs> <laughs> she told me that story. I said, what were you saying? Like, what's that smell? No, it's that burger van. <laughs> <laughs> what a twat. <laughs> but I, watch, I watched a bit of that imitation game, quit the fight, and it, they played him like this tortured, you know, trying to come with it. They were trying to go against him, and he had this theory to it. Yeah. it, it was a crop, it, that reminds shit. you of that. I've got to find it in time like yeah, that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They made that, um, like Dame, whatever she was yeah. called. They made yeah. the oh, Astra Zeneca yeah. yeah. weapon that we kills. Always, he's dressing gown, drinking yeah. coffee, yeah. all uh, bullshit. We'll get, it, we'll get there at the end. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, he's re Benedict, Benedict Cumberbatch also related to um, Tom Hanks as well, funnily enough. But it's interesting that these pl people are playing people who they're actually related to. Um, Cumberbatch's dad was an English actor, uh, Timothy Carlton Cadogan uh, Cumberbatch. Right name. There's a lot of them called Cadogan round here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and his granddad was Commander Henry Carlton Cumberbatch, uh, marine, uh, sub submarine commander. And his great granddad was a diplomat for the Council of Romania, Turkey, and Lebanon. You guys around. Yeah. Just start from nowhere. Uh, it, it's got a history of all his grandfather's been uh, diplomats. His great-granddad was a diplomat. And his great-great-great-granddad was a wealthy slave owner in Barbados. And it, it's interesting that not a lot of this stuff comes out in the, the press when they're talking about that Cumberbatch has got a royal plantagenet bloodline self and mm. what have you. Um, yeah. Oh, he's also, uh, Anx is also related to uh, Aldous Huxley as well, and the founder of the Bloomsbury Group. And Anne Hesh, he's related to Anne Hesh, he's a cousin of Anne Hesh. Oh, yeah, that was murdered in the car. Yeah. Right. That got that got out of an an ambulance. Stretcher. <laughs> yeah, got out of ambulance, yeah. And then pushed back in, I guess. So Forrest Gump's another main uh, film of Tom Hanks as well. And, and this guy here that's running on the bridge that we all thought were Tom Hanks is actually not Tom Hanks, it's Jim Hanks, his brother, who doubles for him. And it says here, as Jim put it, Tom had other doubles, but they couldn't do the run. He says, referring to Gump's stiff, geeky stride. That's a stupid Hanks thing. Good. Doesn't make any sense, that was it. What does that even mean? No. That was also the bit where he famously wipes his face with a t shirt yeah. and then he pulls off the Yeah, the smiley face, face yeah. He invented basically making out the. Uh, Tom he invented, invented the, it, yeah. yeah, invented the smiley face. Um, so he also does the voiceovers for Woody of Toy Story and the toys uh, that they sell and video games and things like that, does Hank's brother. Pretending to be Tom Hanks. Lying. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just wrapping up the Hanks blood line, he's a direct line back to King John of England, signer of the Magna Carta, and his youngest son, King Henry II of England as well, uh, via the Duchess Eleanor of Aqu Aquitaine. He was nicknamed John Lackland, John Without Land. 
just now these names sound yeah. differently when you um yeah so he's direct line descendant of uh king john hank's kids that's his youngest i think that kid with triangle and uh, the eye in the middle i think he's a, he's a rapper isn't check kids check it's hank's in there well, yeah. supposed a rapper yeah actor musician uh he started out in Empire, Shameless, and Your Honor. I've never heard it, watched any of them, have you? No. Um, he'd been in Kirby Your Enthusiasm Asm and Atlanta. Yeah, he's, I think he's a bit of a, he's a troubled, troubled teen, drug addict. He speaks out. There's some interesting... I think I've got a video on here, actually, Evan. Have I? No. Didn't put that on. But there's a, vi the, there's a video of him in his car, a bit like Mark Devlin's car rant, really, in 2020, ranting about... Everyone should take the jab and all this type of stuff. Should and take it, it. Yeah, should. Yeah, yeah. And then it end, and, and he's taking it. And then at the end of it, he's saying, as if I have, and he's effing and blinding, saying it's a load of bullshit and stuff. Oh, right. He's been yeah. sarcastic. Yeah. Apart well, I don't know. It didn't really say whether he'd taken it or he hadn't taken it. So, anyway, it wrote, it wrote here, uh, read here, that in the summer of 2020, Hanks, this is Chet Hanks posted on Instagram, into Instagram in support of the Black Lives Matter movement. That October, he announced on social media that was having a hiatus, saying that pro-Trump conspiracy theorists were targeting his family. QAnon believes has accused his father of engaging in paedophilia and practicing Satanism earlier that year. Right. So he had that tattoo done, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Just to clear it up. Just to clear it all up. <laughs> in August uh, 2021, Hanks posted a video on Instagram, initially urging viewers to get jabbed. He then revealed it was a joke and denied being jabbed himself, claiming, you aren't sticking me with that motherfucking needle. It's only the flu. Get over it. But is that just... Uh, it it seems like a game, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. But so, Sp Spielberg as well. Uh, did you know Spielberg were knighted? No. He's an honorary knight of the British... Empire? He's had a lot of accusations fired at him as Spielberg, hasn't he? Was he? They, they quickly vanish as well. Right. No surprise there. He's a knight commander of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Mm. Spielberg. He's of Ukrainian descent. His father was Arnold Meyer Spielberg, who worked for General Electric, where he invented the first computer-controlled point-of-sale cash register. Right. In 1959. After training as a radio operator gunner for the Air Corps. No plumbers. <laughs> his skills in design of new airplane antennas elevated him to the position, this is his dad, of communications chief of 490th Bomb Squadron in India. And in 1960, his father traveled, so this is the height of the Cold War, traveled to Moscow as part of the delegation of electrical engineers from Phoenix. <laughs> <laughs> the trip coincided with an incident that became part of a subject of his son's 2015 film, Bridge of Spies. No, I've never seen it. It won, lo it won a lot of awards, I think, if I remember rightly. Right. Pushing another thing. Yeah. His sister, Anne Spielberg, she's also a screenwriter and producer, best known for Tom Hanks as Big. Right. I didn't know that. No, neither did I. Mm. But w one thing I've found, some other research I've been doing is on, I found some research by uh, a university, a Jewish university, actually. It's a really interesting research what they've been doing on Jewish names. And that's why at the beginning when I mentioned Oppenheimer, where I got the Oppenheimer uh, spelling deviations from, um, they'd been doing proper genealogy. And it's that it's Jewish university genealogy as well, so it's not made up uh, genealogy. Um, that They've followed all the names back from Frankfurt and where they're spread out into the world. Right. Yeah. Anyway, uh, obviously Spielberg made Schindler's List, um, and the name Rothschild is German, as we know, for red shield. But in Yiddish, it means red coat. Right. He's popped it in there. Yeah. I'm sure it doesn't mean out. <laughs> but again, the, the Schindler's List is as good a film as it was. I remember saying when it came out of cinema. But it's se it's selling you something, isn't it? It's horrible. Selling you, it's selling yeah. you again. Horrible. You know? mm. And it's interesting because we've talked about this before, that after the Second World War, if you think of um, Great Escape and stuff, the Nazis were portrayed totally different, weren't they? They were, there was, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, whatever. But there were still gentlemen and there were still army guys. 
And if you notice right up to now, they've got, they've made them eviler and eviler and eviler and nastier and nastier and nastier. Because you remember that bit in there where he's shooting off his um, balcony? Yeah. They've changed, they've changed direction, haven't they? Even with the Nazi story, if you like. And I'm not pro-Nazi, or I don't dislike, I think Jewish people get screwed over like we do, to be honest with you. There's a different groups, higher echelons of people that more control divide, all this it? stuff. It's more There's more divide. And I think they hide behind the Jewish people so nobody can say anything. Uh, 100%. But, but yeah. So we come to uh, these two Ben Affleck and J-Lo. You often had dead eyes as well as Old Affleck, didn't you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I mean, he's a CIA operative, isn't he? Uh, he had an abusive upbringing as well. He's I've got the same birthday as J-Lo. Have you? Yeah. What characteristics as well? Start to pop it out there. Beard. <laughs> <laughs> Someone's beard. Yeah, someone else's beard. Uh, but his brother Caleb was in. Uh, Caleb, is it Caleb Affleck? Casey. Casey, Casey, Affleck. Casey Affleck was in Opp Oppenheimer. Um, but it's well known that he, Ben Affleck, worked um, with the CIA on many films, many different films. But what I found interesting with this, and I'm going to play a couple of films, hopefully, I've got them on here. Um, there we go. His first wife did a recruitment video for the CIA. So she actually worked for the CIA, Jennifer Garner. I'm Jennifer Garner. I play a CIA officer on the ABC TV series, Alias. In the real world, the CIA serves as our country's first line of defense in the ongoing war against international terrorism. CIA's mission is clear and direct, safeguard America and its people. And it takes smart people with wide ranging talents and diverse backgrounds to carry out this mission. People with integrity, common sense, patriotism and courage, the kind of people who have always worked for the agency. But since the tragic events of 9-11, the CIA has an even stronger need for creative, innovative, flexible men and women from diverse backgrounds with a broad range of perspectives. Right now, the CIA has important, exciting jobs for U.S. citizens, especially those with foreign language skills. Today, the collection of foreign intelligence has never been more vital for national security. If you're an American citizen and seek a challenging, rewarding career where you can make a difference in the world and here at home, contact the agency at www.c. It also helps if you're related to a serial killer, assassin. <laughs> <laughs> can you imagine being in CIA canteen? Why did you join up? Do you not see that Jennifer Garner advert? <laughs> <laughs> What else would it be? Yeah. Uh, funnily enough, Ben Affleck also shares a number of famous cousins um, and well-known spies from the American Revolution, a guy called Nathan Hale. He was an American patriot, soldier, and spy for the Continental Army during the American Revolution. And he volunteered for intelligence gathering missions in New York City and was captured and executed by the British. Hale is considered an American hero. Other descendants include William Williams, an American founding father and signer of Declaration of Independence. You don't forget his name, will you? Who was called for short? Billy Billy. Billy, Billy. <laughs> uh, Mormon founder Joseph Smith, American legend jo Jonathan Chapman, a.k.a. Johnny Appleseed. And he's also related to Glenn Co Close, Mark Wahlberg, Brooke Shields, Shirley Temple, uh, Kyra Sedgwick, Bacon, Kevin Bacon's wife, Raquel Welsh, Humphrey Bogart. And he goes back to, his lineage goes back to Charlemagne and William the Conqueror. Now, the reason I'm talking about these two is because their, J-Lo's daughter is now called M, and she's gender, he or she's gender neutral. And it so happens that Garner and Affleck's daughter now is called Finn. Um, so just listen to, um, that's, Jennifer Lopez's daughter, M, them, pronouns. But you'd like that if I... Uh, yeah, I would, actually. Any air. <laughs> <laughs> so th this is this is Finn at the... Um, y y talking, doing a eulogy at his grandfather, his, uh, whatever, grandfather's um, memorial. Hello, my name is Finn Affleck. I'm reading verse 8. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness than large income with injustice. She's got a deeper voice than you. <laughs> she ain't one ever usually. Yeah. No, but just listen now how he or she's acting to put the voice on deep right at the beginning. 
Hello, my name is Finn Affleck. I'm reading verse 8. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 8. Better is a little with righteousness than large income with injustice. God knows what that meant, but anyway. You have to feel a bit sorry for these kids. I do feel sorry for these kids. And that, that's the next one where... You're being agenderized. Why, why, why are all these, whatever, A-list You're celebs... Told to. Uh, well, I think there's more to it than that, Chris, to be honest with you. There's something, something else going on. I don't think... I think going back to what we were talking about, mm. you know, that video we played the other week mm. where they've got that psycho mother. Mm. Well, yeah, what yeah. the odds of two people getting married and both their kids have got trans or non-binary what are the odds of that going back 20 years well there's who is it as well isn't there will smith's kid they're both he's got yeah. a girl and a boy and i think they've both done a switcheroo mm. so yeah. is it your gender though they've just been told what's an agenda agenda yeah, <laughs> yeah. agenda yeah. told what to do so you've got these guys that did the uh i mean it were you that told me about this the matrix films matrix films the wachowski brothers sisters now. yeah not sisters now sorry she the the one with the uh bananas in her hair She's Lana, and the other one's Lily. I mean, you can't. Oh, um, Lily. They, they were, that were very that, that were very early on as well. The, <laughs> when they when they changed, wasn't it? Um, yeah, quite a long time ago. Yeah. It used to be odd carriers from Castleford. <laughs> 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 one of them definitely transformed better than the other. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Which one? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Which one are you looking at? <laughs> <laughs> Two drinks. <laughs> For a penny? Yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Lily. <laughs> <laughs> what do we make of Russell Brand? It'd be an interesting talking conversation. What? Yeah. I mean, I don't listen to the guy. I never have liked him. He creeps me out a little bit, to be honest with you. But um, I don't know if he said this. This was a few years ago. I think it was about 2016 when he said this. Um, Did I remember this? You've I told remember. me about yeah, it, yeah. Remember, yeah. Um, so I don't know if he's if he's followed followed through. The right word, that's it. But I don't know if he's <laughs> followed through with this. But uh, uh, yeah, um, we don't we don't know the gender, and I may not even ever impose a gender upon it. Let the child grow up, and whatever the hell it is, never tell it. There's is such a con. I don't, I don't know what he means by that. Prick. Uh, yeah. Well, it's pretty simple. If you have a child, to know what gender it is. Yeah, it was at one point. <laughs> <laughs> now you've got a flag and everything. Yeah. Yeah. So Megan Fox, it was my wife that told me about Megan Fox. Right. Um, she's brought her kids up, and that's a boy. That in uh, pink there. Oh, I think it's a boy. Megan Fox has had major problems as well, hasn't she? Um, her stepfather apparently abused her. Right. Um, and so she's bringing them up in boys or girls. Um, and she's struggled with manic depression, um, et cetera. Um, yeah, she's got OCD, self-harming. She believes that all humans are born with the ability to be attracted to both sexes. It's more the selling of it, isn't it? Why the why are yeah. they selling it? Um, no one really minds. Do what you want, but yeah. hey, it's the blatant selling of selling it. of it to children. Um, I mean, we've all seen this stuff here, where you know the the chemicals they're putting into water and things like that are changing what uh, frogs and fish and mm. stuff like. Well, this I think sex. you've all, you, as well as it being agenda driven, you've always said. There is something there. It's got to be chemically or, or frequency as well. It has to be. Uh, that both. tunes into or it. All or all, all of the above. Yeah. Um, it, because, again, if, if if 100 years ago, one in a thousand people were whatever, purple, and then roll on to 2000 and it's 100 out of a thousand people, and something's changed in the environment, it, it isn't just mm. to to alter those people, hasn't it? Mm. It can't just happen naturally. Yeah. Well, I suppose have, it could inbreed, you know. Did whatever, you have that video, the, that woman having a child? I don't know if I brought it with me. No, um, I don't know if anyone saw it on a sheep farm where the woman's trying to get a... I have got it, actually, but it's on a, one of the Matrix videos. It's, it's horrible. Yeah. yeah, horrible, where she's basically pinning that kid down and putting... Did you see it? It's awful, well, the, the, it? the doctor actually says, uh, when you're 14, you'll be at the age where we can give you blockers. You'd be happy to know, or something like that. And they pin the kid down, and the kid's yeah. screaming. So the... the, the yeah. Mm. You see the mother's Horrible. face with a joker grin. 
Yeah, it was on the Matrix video, yeah. It's, yeah. Dr. Olson had a decision. You are in the perfect place to start on blockers. And she promises to begin giving her estrogen, female hormones, in two years. Around 13. That's what I think. Yes, you're not going to develop breast buds on the blockers. But um, you're not going to wait until 16 to start. You know that, okay? Josie received the blockers as an implant in her arm. It's okay if you cry. So with all the bravery she could muster, you gonna feel a little bit of a Josie held on tight as another chapter opened in this young girl's life. <laughs> a lot of times it strikes me that had this happened just 20 years ago, Thank you. I wouldn't have been able to give her blockers and she would have had to go through male puberty. That terrifies me. It's all done. Do you want a hug? I don't know that she would have survived male puberty. Well, again, the, the, behavior, the mental disorders for mothers who force the If you think about it, if a, if a child's born and you bring it up as a girl and it's a boy, by the time it gets to five, it wouldn't know, would it? No. Because it'd think having whatever bits it's got, that well, means it's whatever sex you've told it is. They don't know either, do they? Yeah. They don't know what's what. Because it's not something they'd have a conversation about with the friends, yeah. is it, either? So bring a boy up as a girl or a girl as a boy, they would automatically think that after a few years of that. But the, the, this study, however much this study is worth, has pointed out that 50% of mothers who take boys for gen gender, uh, whatever, uh, changes, um, have got mental issues. That's not a shock, is it? Not really, I'd say it were higher. I knew he'd like that. So asked whether he watched the Kardashians, our good friend here, Baron Cameron, um, said, no, but I'm related to them. Uh, <laughs> did you know I'm 13th cousins? He knew. He knew. He knew. He knew, he knew yeah. 13th cousins. Um, she's also related. Oh. The Kardashians are also related to Boris Johnson. I think they're literally a haven of witches. <laughs> Don't you think uh, that uh, tran Tranny, or whatever he is, looks like Melinda Gates? Oh, yeah. There is a look there, isn't yeah. there? <laughs> yeah. Don't fancy yours much. Mm. Yeah, so she's related. She got a royal. She goes back to uh, Boris Johnson, the share an ancestor, not Boris Johnson, David Cameron, the share an ancestor, uh, Sir William Spencer. Uh, born in 1555. Isn't it weird how they came about? Because what have they done? What what have they actually achieved? You know, I, d I don't understand. Well, I know it's more it's conditioning. Isn't it? It's part of their programming, but they, they they don't deliver anything, do they? No. They, they don't. They're not funny. No. In fact, they're opposite of being funny. It's a very yeah. nasty, mean spirited program. Yeah. Yeah, it is. But not that. What, have you watched it with your missus? You don't want to admit it, do you? <laughs> <laughs> I might have seen a bit of one once. Yeah. Uh, not really. A bit of one what? Series? Yeah. I think I did see a bit of one where yeah, they were just arguing. about everything. Constantly arguing. Yeah. That's what a lot of these programmes are now. Well, that's how people learn how to argue from TV. Yeah. But I mean, she she's related to uh, jo President uh, John Adams, John Quincy Adams, uh, Calvin Coolidge, both Bushes again, Canadian Prime Ministers, also in a family. Sir Robert Borden, Sir Charles Tupper. Uh, they also include Lucille Ball, Ted Danson, which Tom Hanks is related to. Yeah. Uh, yep. Ellen uh, Degenerate, Johnny Carson, Carson Bill Nye, you know that annoying science, science, science guy? Yeah. Yep. Sun in the Moon. Yeah. Henry and Jane Fonda. Yeah. Um, her stepfather, um, as we know, is the former Olympic decathlon gold medalist uh, Bruce Jenner, is there with the lovely long brown auburn hair, uh, came out in public as probably the most famous transgender person in the world when he announced he was now a she. Was that the beginning of it all? That was the real beginning, wasn't it? Uh, I would say around 2015 was the changing of it. Although Lennox Lewis's um, ex-manager, promoter. Yeah, but no, 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 one knows that. no, yeah. no one knew that story. Yeah, but he, he were around that. I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that because people's minds are being wiped, um, that they actually believe the thought they were a woman for this long. 
And I wouldn't know because I'm not going through that experience. <laughs> but all in a Wednesday. Oh, um, <laughs> oh no. but you, you, yeah. Because people are getting illnesses where their minds have been you know, mm. forgetting things mm. and disorientated and what have you. Who knows? It might have uh, been MK Ultra. Who knows? It might have been zapped in the head. Mm. But very strange. But why get to 60? You, you, can, you can stay, you know. A dog can stay. <laughs> needs a, needs <laughs> a dump. <laughs> <laughs> So Samantha Cameron, she's an interesting character as well, because the, often the first, or whatever they call them, first ladies, she's the daughter of Sir Reginald Sheffield, eighth Baron, and Annabelle uh, uh, Jones. Uh, Sir Reginald and Annabelle married in uh, on the 11th of November, 1969. The couple divorced. Sir Reginald was educated at Eton. He married Annabelle Jones, uh, with whom he had two daughters, Samantha and Emily Sheffield. She's a British journalist, editor of the Evening Standard. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, the family seat is at Sutton Park, uh, 18th century Georgian house. So she's just not some housewife who was washing dishes at number 10. You, d you did just seem that they have uh, arranged marriages, these people, yeah. I would say, wouldn't you? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, at Suf Sutton Park, they received 350,000 for the wind turbines. <laughs> They've got Indian version, they're called wind turbines. <laughs> Ooh, that's poor. <laughs> Crap, but you've got to get it out there sometimes, don't you? Test it out. Um, but they are in the, the Sheffield, ba Sheffield Baronetcy of Normanby in County Lincoln um, that was created for Charles Herbert Sheffield, the legitimate son of John Sheffield, first Duke of Buckinghamshire, or Buckingham. So that's her family. And now they're married into the Astor family, her mother remarried into the Astor family. So the Astor family, obviously, uh, we know about the Astors. They're one of Fitz Springmeyer's. He was that's the first in the book, isn't it? The Astors Certainly are first yeah. in the book. Uh, the Bloodlines of the Illuminati by Fitz Springmeyer. So there's Cameron's uh, bloodlines, and there's her. She goes back to King Charles II. That's all we have time for in this presentation. Stay tuned for the next one which I think you'll find very interesting indeed when we go deep into the background and genealogy of Don Jolly, who seems to be, be being used as some kind of uh, agent, change agent for the government, basically. See you soon. Bye.